Um, hello everyone, thank you very much for joining us today. So today we're going to be going through infectious diseases. Um, we've got Dr Oliver Maynard here to teach us. So if you look on the top right hand side, that's the QR code that links you to our Instagram page. Um, so please follow us and you'll get all the updates of sessions coming up. Um, and in the lower corner, you'll see our email address. So if you have any emails um, from being here or from um, watching the session, please email us um, and any questions, just let us know. Um, so this is the QR code to our polls. So please join our polls and as we go through, you can um, vote on your answers. And I think that's about everything. So I'll hand over to Ollie now to get started. Right, thanks for that. Um, hello everyone, uh, my name's Ollie. Um, I'm a doctor, I'm an F2. I'm working in uh, West London at the moment and uh, I'm going to be talking about specifically bacteriology but covering different aspects of microbiology and infectious diseases. Um, so uh, yeah, I was originally asked to do the whole of infectious diseases microbiology, but I couldn't fit it into one session, so we're going to break it down. And this one's specifically about bacteria and antibiotics, but there'll be other ones coming up about um, viruses, fungi, and parasites as well. Um, so yeah, uh, I hope it's uh, useful, and uh, we'll get straight into it. It'll be based around um, single best answer questions. Um, there'll be a question, and I'll give you time to answer it, uh, and then I'll go on to um, explain. Uh, the answer and then obviously just a bit around that topic. Uh, so yeah, so this is obviously a, a free resource and uh, it's just for uh, educational purposes only. I'm focusing it at a sort of uh, finals med school sort of level. Uh, so what we're going to cover, so we'll start off with some uh, basic microbiology, just a recap, hopefully this should all be familiar to you. Uh, I'll then talk about sort of gram staining, um, common uh, pathogenic bacteria as there are a lot of them I won't be able to cover all of them but maybe some of the main ones and their presentations uh, antibiotics and antibiotic resistance and then uh, finally a little bit uh, on vaccines um, so there'll be a lot to cover so this isn't in any way uh, a comprehensive cover of the whole of infectious diseases but hopefully it's enough to um, you know uh, give you a prompt into uh, what you need to read further and what you know well and stuff like that okay bro um, so first question uh, which of the following is a feature of prokaryotic cells? So A, DNA within a nuclear membrane, C, membrane-bound organelles, C, cell wall containing peptidoglycan, uh, D, mitotic replication, or E, pseudopods as organs of locomotion. Um, so I'll give you just a few seconds to think about what your answer would be. So I would go with C, um, cell walls containing uh, peptidoglycan. All of the rest are not features of uh, prokaryotic cells. Um, so let's talk a bit about microorganisms, what they are and, and, and how we define them. Um, so there are five uh, main classes of uh, microorganisms that uh, affect humans, that cause disease. Uh, and these can be divided into cellular organisms and non-cellular. Um, so the cellular ones being bacteria, which I think we're all familiar with, which are prokaryotes, which we're talking mostly about today. You then get protozoa, which are sort of parasites. They're small, normal, normally single cellular organisms, um, which normally have to, um, they're parasitic, so they survive off uh, other normally larger organisms. Um, helmets, which are sort of worms, which again fit into that sort of parasitic um, category. Uh, fungi, which includes yeasts and molds. And then there's obviously uh, viruses, uh, which are generally classified as non-cellular. There's always that big debate about whether they're living or not, um, but they require um, other organisms and their intracellular machinery to, to reproduce. Um, so they're not um, typically believed to be cellular. Um, hang on a sec, let me see if I can hide this. Um, so yeah, so all, all cells will contain DNA and RNA, whereas viruses normally only contain one. So that's a, a normally a differentiation between um, it being cellular and not cellular. Um, uh, and of the cellular organisms, bacteria, prokaryotes, whereas the other three are, are eukaryotic. Uh, 
Um, so we can talk a little bit more about that and the differences between them. So eukaryotic cells, like in animals and humans, um, they have a nuclear membrane normally um, with the DNA stored inside, whereas uh, in bacteria, prokaryotes, it can be floating in the cytosol. Uh, they normally um, divide by binary fission, um, whereas you know, eukaryotic cells undergo mitosis and then sometimes meiosis. Um, there's difference in the number of genetic material. Um, there's difference in the size of the ribosomes. Um, and bacteria um, generally have a cell wall, although we'll go on to talk about some that don't. Um, and that cell wall is normally made of peptidoglycan, whereas eukaryotic cells don't tend to have uh, cell walls. Um, so some bacteria are motile, most of them are motile. And if they are motile, um, they use flagella. Um, so one of the answers was pseudo. Pods, um, but that is a, a method of locomotion for um, other organisms, um, possibly a uh, protozoa. Whereas if bacteria move, they 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 move by flagella. Um, and most can replicate extracellularly, but there are some bacteria which we'll go on to talk about, um, which are obligate intracellular organisms, so they have to live within other cells. Brilliant. So on to number two. Uh, a 30 year old IVDU with splinter hemorrhages had blood cultures which have grown gram positive cocci arranged in bunches, which is the most likely organism. So for anyone who doesn't know, IVDU stands for intravenous drug user. So is it A, Staphylococcus aureus, B, Streptococcus pneumoniae, C, Neisseria meningitidis, D, Escherichia coli, or E, Listeria monocytogenes? So the answer is A, um, Staph aureus, uh, and we we'll can go on to explain why. So first of all, let's talk about gram staining. So in the um, in the vignette, it said they were gram positive. So gram staining is a, a lab method of trying to differentiate different bacteria, and you can either be gram positive or you can be gram negative. And the way that I remember the two different differentiations is the gram negative bacteria will turn red and, you know, red negative bad is the way of remembering it. Uh, and then the other ones will be a, a, a purple blue color and that's the gram positive bacteria. So this way of just distinguishing bacteria is, is pretty useful uh, and it works in most bacteria, but there are a, a, a few certain ones which don't um, fit this rule. Um, so intracellular bacteria, um, don't really work with gram staining. Um, the ones that lack cell walls, so because the gram staining, um, actually uh, the, the dye attaches to the cell walls. So if you don't have a cell wall, it's nothing to attach to. Um, acid fast bacteria like mycobacterium, um, so that's where they have a waxy coating surrounding their cell walls, so um, uh, it doesn't stick and, it's, and, and uh, you can't use gram staining. And then there are some bacteria which are, are, are very small, so, so difficult to, to use. Um, uh, the gram staining method. Um, so this is the general way it works. So you have gram positive bacteria with a very thick peptidoglycan cell wall and you have gram negative bacteria with a much smaller peptidoglycan wall. Um, so the first stage is fixing your bacteria to a slide. Um, you then dye the bacteria with that blue crystal violet dye and that dye gets absorbed into the peptidoglycan cell wall. Um, you then um, treat it with iodine and then it gets washed and in the small cell walls it's much easier for the dye to get washed out and it's much harder for the dye to stick um, so the dye will be more readily washed out whereas in the thick gram positive cell walls um, the dye is much more likely to stay and stay um, um, that purple color and then you re-stain um, the sample with saffron dye which is the red color um, and which it um, will then re-dye the gram negatives which have lost that purple dye when washed um, and then that's how you get the two different um, gram stains. Um, so the way that I uh, remember um, which um, are which in terms of gram positive and gram negative um, is when I think about gram positive I think about a big blue down jacket um, so they have this big thick 
peptidoglycan cell wall. So if you were wearing a, a, a big down jacket, the environment that you'd like to live in would be cool and dry because you've got a nice thick warm jacket, so you don't mind cold environments. Uh, but down jackets, you know, if you get them wet, they're very hard to dry out. Um, so you don't really want it to be a wet environment. Um, so they like cool and dry environments. Um, so that's stuff like skin flora um, or the oropharynx and the airways where there's lots of air. Uh, I know it doesn't work 100%. I know airways aren't really strictly that dry, but kind of think of air and um, think about um, it being drier than, say, the bowel or something. Um, so this is generally true that this is where the gram positives like to live. Obviously, there's some exceptions to the rule. Um, Enterococcus can be found in the bowel. We'll talk about that more later. Uh, but in general, um, that's what I think of gram positive. And then the gram negatives, I think of a red anorak. So if you're in a red anorak, it's not very thick, so it's not going to keep you very warm. So you want the environment you are in to be quite warm, um, but it is very waterproof. So you don't mind if it being wet. So you'll have that wet and warm environment. And the way you remember that is the three B's. So they live in the bowel, uh, the bladder and the biliary system. Uh, in general, obviously, there are again a bacteria that are gram negative that get into the airways uh, like Pseudomonas. Um, but in general, um, if it's gram negative, um, it will be in one of these uh, warm and wet environments. So this is a very busy slide, um, but I'll, I'll break it down. So this is basically every single um, pathogen that you'll need to remember, almost. Um, and this is something that I have off the top of my head. It's actually really useful. Um, it seems quite complicated, but we'll, we'll go piece by piece. Um, so you draw a two by two square and we have gram positives on this side, gram negatives on this side. Uh, and then we have um, coccus up here. So that's round looking bacteria. And then we have bacillus. So that's rod looking bacteria. Um, so in the in the top left quadrant, um, we have gram positive cocci. Um, now, really, there's only two sort of pathogenic pathogenic uh, bacteria that fall into this category for humans, and uh, that's Staphylococcus and that's Streptococcus. Um, so I've written Enterococcus down here, which is technically a subdivision of Streptococcus, but they're often talked about like they're different organisms, so I've sort of separated them out here. Um, so of Staphylococcus species, there's three which are most common that cause um, problems in humans. Uh, Staph aureus, um, which most people know about, it can cause um, methotillinin resistant Staph aureus, uh, MRSA. Uh, it can cause pneumonias and cellulitis and such. Um, there's Saprophyticus, which is the most um, one of the most common causes of UTIs. And there's uh, Staph epidermidis, um, which often causes line infections. If you have a central line or a midline or a pick line, um, that can become infected with epidermidis. Uh, it's also an, often a contaminant um, when you take blood cultures because it lives on the skin. So if you're not too aseptic when you're taking blood cultures, it can grow epidermidis. And so then of the Streptococcus, um, you need to know group A, which is called Pyogenes, strep, uh, group B, which is Agalactica, which is quite hard to say, so you normally say group B. Uh, and then there's um, strep pneumoniae, which is uh, commonly known as pneumococcus. Uh, so we're going to talking about a little bit more about these later. Uh, and then of the Enterococcus species, there's two which mainly cause um, infections in humans, which is Enterococcus faecium and Enterococcus faecalis. So that's it, really. Um, that's what you um, need to remember for your gram positives, staph and strep, uh, and then three staph, three strep, and, and, and two Enterococcus. So then we'll move over to the gram negative cocci. So really, there's only one species that we need to remember here. That's Nyseria. Uh, and there's two uh, main species, sorry, one, one genus, Nyseria, and two main species. So uh, Nyseria meningitidis, so that causes um, uh, meningococcal um, infections. And then Nyseria gonorrhea, which is um, the bacteria which is caused gonorrhea, which is a sexually transmitted infection. Uh, and that's it. They're the main ones you need to remember for gram negative cocci. Uh, so let's go move down to the gram positive rods. Um, so this one's where it gets a bit more difficult to remember. Um, so I remember it were by A, B, C, D, L. Um, so it's a bit rogue with the L at the end, but it kind of sticks in my mind. Um, so the A is actinomycosis, which can normally cause infections with sort of interuterine devices, the coils, it can get stuck around and it can cause pelvic inflammatory disease. Uh, so the B is uh, bacillus. Um, which the two main species that you need to know are anthraces, which it causes anthrax, um, which was uh, a little while ago in the 20th century was on, used as a um, 
a biological uh, weapon of warfare that's not really seen as much anymore, uh, and cirrus, which causes food poisoning. Um, so then ABC, we're talking about clostridium, and there are four main pathogenic um, species of clostridium. Um, so clostridium difficile or C. diff, which a lot of people will have heard about, um, which can cause diarrhea. Clostridium tetani, which can cause tetanus, which also a lot of people will know about. Uh, clostridium botulinum, which its toxin actually uh, is the Botox. So when you get Botox and it paralyzes um, the muscles, um, uh, that's actually produced by the uh, Clostridium species botulinum. And then there's Clostridium perfrigens, um, which is important in food poisoning and sometimes can cause gas gangrene. So we've got A, B, C, D. So Carinobacterium diphtheria is the D in that one, um, which causes the disease diphtheria. Uh, and then ABCDL um, is listeria, which can cause um, some meningitis. Um, we'll go on to talk about meningitis a bit more later on, um, but it's more common in, in certain age groups. OK, so we've got one left. So we, we know it's uh, gram positive cocci, we've got uh, staph and strep. Gram negative cocci, we've got Neisseria. And then gram positive rods, we've got ABCDL. And now every other pathogen goes into this category, gram negative rods. So if it's not staph strep, Neisseria or ABCDL, we can pop it in the gram negative rods. So that's everything, Pseudomonas, Salmonella, Shigella, lots of gut toxins, um, Proteus, Helicobacter. So that causes, you know, um, gastritis, Haemophilus, Legionella. So if you're ever presented with a new bacteria that you're not really sure what it is, think, OK, is it staph, is it strep? No. OK, is it Neisseria? No. Is it ABCDL? No, it must be a gram negative rod. And so that's uh, how I remember these. So like every rule, there's got to be um, some that break the rule. Um, so this is miscellaneous bacteria. So uh, mycobacterium doesn't fall into the, the gram staining um, methodology like we spoke about earlier. The main one is mycobacterium tuberculosis, so TB. Um, we'll talk about a little bit more about that later on as well. Uh, but there are other there are other mycobacterium species that uh, aren't tuberculosis uh, and they're generally grouped together and called non-tuberculous mycobacterium or MAC, which is mycobacterium avum complex. Um, mycobacterium bovis falls into this and there's mycobacterium leprae, which is the um, bacteria which causes leprosy. Um, so the gram stain doesn't stick to those uh, because of a waxy coating on the outside of the bacteria, um, so it doesn't fall into the gram staining um, algorithm. Uh, there's mycobacterium, for which there's only really one that's pathogenic to humans, which is myco, uh, sorry, mycoplasma, which there's only one, which is mycoplasma pneumoniae, um, which doesn't have a cell wall, so it can't be gram stained. Uh, there's chlamydia, which is, lives intracellularly. Uh, there's two, chlamydia uh, trach trachomatis, which is caused chlamydia STIs, and chlamydia pneumoniae, which can cause atypical uh, pneumonia infections. Uh, and then there's the rickettsii, or the rickettsia diseases, uh, and these are less common um, diseases, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, uh, very small, um, so they don't actually, I mean like physically small, um, so uh, they don't work very well with grand staining, but um, much less common, you'll see uh, a lot fewer of that. Um, so let's break this down a little bit further. So of the brown gram positive cocci, we know we have staph and we know we have strep. And so how do we, you know, define between them? So staph actually, I think in Greek or Latin, sorry, I don't know which, uh, means grapes because the staph bacteria kind of clump together in their cocci and look like kind of bunches of grapes. Uh, whereas strep means chain. Um, so they normally form in chains. So circles, coccus in chain, strep. Circles, coccus in grapes, staph. So that's uh, an easy one to remember. So, um, and in the question, I think it said um, uh, gram positive cocci in the form of bunches. Um, so we're already looking at a staph species. Um, so there's further ways of distinguishing between staph and strep other than um, just their morphology. Um, so all staphylococcuses are catalase positive. So catalase is an enzyme which catalases the reaction of peroxide um, into water and oxygen. And obviously oxygen uh, is a gas, um, so it produces bubbles. So if you have a colony of strep and you and you plonk um, some hydrogen peroxide on it, the enzyme catalase will catalyze that reaction and you'll see bubbles. Whereas uh, strep is uh, catalase negative, so if you put some peroxide on it, uh, nothing will happen. 
Um, so that's um, a way of categorizing between the both of them. Um, so we've we've put some um, hydrogen peroxide on and it started bubbling, so we know it's a, a staph. Um, so then how do we find define between different staph species? Um, so then there's another enzyme called coagulase. Um, so this is an enzyme which um, helps the reaction of fibrinogen into fibrin. So if we plonked a bit of fibrin on this, um, it would uh, undergo a reaction and turn into uh, fibrinogen, it would go into fibrin uh, and it would cause this precipitate. And of the staphylococcuses, aureus is the one which is coagulase positive, um, uh, whereas epidermidis and saprophyticus is coagulase negative. Um, so if you have a bacteria which is catalase positive and coagulase positive, you're almost definite that it's going to be staph aureus. So there's still two bacteria that we need to distinguish between. So if we're trying to distinguish between saprophyticus and epidermidis, we can do a novobiosin test. Um, so this is an, actually an antibiotic. Um, so you grow um, some of the bacteria and you plonk a bit of no, novobiosin in the middle um, and saprophyticus is actually resistant, so it won't be destroyed, whereas ep epidermidis um, is sensitive to novobiosin, um, so the novobiosin will uh, destroy the epidermidis. Um, so that's how you distinguish between uh, those two species of staph. Um, so here's a, a table that I've brought together um, that um, just summarises what I've just said. Um, so in regards to staphylococcus, um, 90% of the staphylococcus uh, in the UK is resistant to penicillin. So very high rate of resistance. Therefore, you don't tend to treat um, staphylococcus infections with simple penicillin, uh, penicillin G. You have to use something like flucoxacillin, um, which will often get prescribed if you have cellulitis and, or if you confirm a, a staph um, say bacteremia or something in their blood culture, uh, then the first line is normally flucoxacillin because it's uh, so resistant. So let's go on to talk about the other gram positive cocci strep. So we know it's formed in chains uh, and we use the Lance field classification to distinguish between different uh, streptococcuses. So some streptococcuses um, produce streptolysin, um, which hydrolyzes red blood cells. Um, so it can either do this completely, it completely hemolyzes the red blood cells. Um, so we call that beta hemolytic. It can partially hemolyze the red blood cells uh, called partial hemolysis, which is alpha hemolytic. Um, or you can have some strep species which don't produce any streptolysin, so don't cause this any hemolysis and that's your gamma species. Uh, just as a bit of a side note, most streptococcus come in long chains, um, but some come in diplococci, but that's just two um, circles next to each other. Uh, and that's kind of pathognomonic, pathognomonic for pneumococcus, so this species here. So if you ever get a question in your final talking about uh, gram positive pococci in pairs, it's normally talking about pneumococcus. So there are further tests to distinguish uh, between, say, um, beta hemolytic streptococci, um, and they're all uh, bacteria tests. So optochin and uh, bacitracin, sorry, I don't say these words very often, um, will have different sensitivities. And that's how you tell the difference between group A strep, group B strep, um, strep veridens, pneumococcus, uh, and then the way of distinguish between different types of um, gamma hemolytic strep uh, is you can grow them in, in different um, salt solutions. So as we see here, um, enterococci is technically a species of streptococcus, but it's often talked about like they're, they're different. So talking about strep, most of the streptococcus in the UK is sensitive to penicillins. Um, so conditions that are caused by strep often like strep throat, or, or tonsillitis, uh, the first line of penicillins, uh, simple penicillins as well. You don't have to go for uh, flucoxacillin or, or stuff that's um, based around uh, resistance. Uh, and there has never been a reported case of group A strep that is resistant to penicillin. So very, very sensitive. OK, so I know that was a lot of information, um, but just a quick one on enterococcus. Um, so it's a, a part of the normal gut flora often. Um, it, it's one of these gram positive bacteria that I say breaks the rule and can be found in uh, wet and warm um, conditions like the biliary tree uh, and the genitourinal system. 
and can often cause infections. It's actually the most common cause of gram positive cocci UTI would be an enterococcus. Uh, um, it has high levels of resistance, which we'll go on to talk about more. Um, and we're starting to see some superbugs, some vancomycin resistant enterococci. Um, and just a quick tip that I got is that enterococcus fucalis, so with S at the end, is generally more sensitive to antibiotics than fecium. So you can remember S for sensitive. Um, so the person in, in the uh, clinical vignette, if we just quickly go back to. Um, so they're a 30 year old intravenous drug user. Um, they have splinter hemorrhages, um, which is our little kind of um, septic emboli in the fingernails, which you can see. And they have a bacteremia because their blood cultures have grown um, Staphylococcus aureus. Um, so this could all lead to a bacteremia and the splinter hemorrhages point us towards he might be suffering from a condition um, called infective endocarditis. Um, so I covered quite a lot of different um, presentations of infections uh, in this talk. So I've tried to narrow them all down to one fact sheet. Um, I, you could do a whole talk on infective endocarditis, um, but it would take far too long. So I've just tried to narrow it down to um, the prominent things. So it, it's an infection on the, the inner linings of the heart, so endocarditis. Risk factors include intravenous drug use, so um, introducing bacteria into the bloodstream. Um, another way of doing that is through a central line. Um, the bacteria often cause vegetation, so clumping, uh, especially on heart valves, especially on the mitral valve on the left-hand side of the heart. And that's what we're looking at here on a transthoracic echocardiogram. Um, so if you have a prosthetic heart valve, um, it's more likely to get stuck. Um, and if you have underlying valvular disease, like aromatic heart disease, the bacteria is more likely to get stuck because there's already scarring there somewhere so they're there to attach to. Uh, and also poor oral hygiene can uh, translocate down to the, to the heart. So 90% of IE um, is left side of the heart. So that's mitral valve or aortic valve. But uh, there is 10% which is on uh, the right side. So uh, pulmonary valve or tricuspid. Uh, and of the right sided infective encarditis, being an IBDU is, is um, one of the major risk factors. Um, so a TTE, transthoracic echocardiogram, is first line, um, but unfortunately if you don't see any vegetations it can't definitively rule out infective endocarditis, so then you have to go for a transesophageal um, ultrasound, um, which is T-O-E. Um, transesophageal echocardiogram, sorry, T-O-E. Um, so it's diagnosed using the Duke's criteria. So there's major criteria and there's minor criteria, um, which you might want to look up. I didn't put it on this slide because there's quite a lot of information. Uh, but that's what the diagnostic criteria you need. Some from the major criteria and some from the minor criteria uh, to get a definitive diagnosis. It's a high mortality rate. Um, it's a, a you know very serious condition. You need to be in hospital. You can require weeks of IV antibiotics. And these are some of the signs and symptoms. So this is splinter hemorrhages. So this is bits of the of the vegetation will break off. Uh, they're called septic emboli and they can get stuck under the fingernails and that causes splinter hemorrhages. Um, these are roth spots. So these are tiny little um, septic emboli in the retina that you might see. Uh, and these are Janeway lesions and oslanodes. So the way to remember them is oslanodes starts with an O and so does owl. So oslanodes are painful. They make you go owl uh, and they're generally found on the fingers, whereas Janeway lesions are normally found on the palms and they're normally flat macular and don't cause any pain. Um, so it's good to remember some of the signs and symptoms of infective endocarditis because it's a, it's a common question in exams. Right, it's a very long question, but we'll, we'll move on to the next one. The rest of the questions will be a, a bit shorter in their explanations. Um, so question three, an obese 42 year old female attends A&E with fever, jaundice and right upper quadrant pain. You start gentamicin. Which of the following is the mechanism of action of gentamicin? So is it A, inhibition of cell wall synthesis, B, inhibition of protein synthesis, S30 subunit, C, in inhibition of protein synthesis, 50S subunit, or D, inhibition of DNA synthesis, or E, inhibition of folic acid synthesis. So, uh, B, inhibition of protein synthesis of the S30 subunit of the ribosomes. 
So let's go on to talk about antibiotics. Um, so the main task of antibiotics is what's called selective toxicity. Um, so they want to be toxic to um, bacteria cells, um, but they want to not be toxic to obviously to human cells. So they have to find distinguishing features that are in uh, prokaryotic cells that aren't in eukaryotic cells. Um, so that's what we were talking about here in the first question. Um, so bacteria have cell walls where human cells don't, so we could target that. Um, bacteria have different ribosomes to humans, so we could um, target that. Uh, they have different uh, cell membranes and um, antigens on their cell membranes, which we could target, uh, and different nucleic acids in DNA. So these are all things that antibiotics could target um, that aren't on human cells. And so back, antibiotics can be classified into two major categories. They can be bactericidal, uh, which kills the bacteria, or bacteriostatic, which simply inhibits their growth. Um, so the benefit of bactericidal antibiotics are that they kill the bacteria, um, so they don't rely on macrophages, um, so they're used in life-threatening situations, they're used when you have very low neutrophils, so you have neutropenic sepsis, uh, and endocarditis, uh, where the phagocytes can't get into that fibrinous network of the vegetation. Um, so if the patient's very unwell, you probably need to be using a bactericidal. But there's bacteriostatic, um, so it stops them from growing, and then you use the host's um, um, immune system um, to actually break down the bacteria themselves. So another big slide. So these are the, the some of the classes of antibiotics, some of the main ones we use. These are the examples of those classes. Uh, this is how uh, they work. And this is generally whether they're bactericidal or bacteriostatic. Um, so you don't have to remember everything on this slide. It may be worth remembering some of the major classes of antibiotics, obviously penicillins, um, they use the beta-lactam ring to break down cell walls and they're bactericidal, that's probably a great one to remember. Uh, and then we developed cephalosporins, again use a, a beta-lactam ring, uh, cephalosporins are easy to remember because they normally start with kef, keftraxone, keftazidine, again they use beta-lactam so they work in exactly the same wall, break down cell walls. Um, and then carbapenems were invented after then, again use beta-lactams, uh, meropenem, ertapenem, they all end in penem, uh, and again use the beta-lactam ring to break down cell walls. Um, quinolones or fluoroquinolones can all be remembered because they have floxacin at the end, ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, uh, example of a bactericidal. Um, uh, macrolids um, all end in mycin, clarithromycin, azithromycin, erythromycin, um, and then aminoglycosides um, all end in just sin, gentamicin, amicacin. Um, so they have two different actions. So they break, so both macrolids and amino acids um, break down uh, protein synthesis by affecting ribosomes. Macrolids affect the 50S subunit of the ribosome, whereas amino acids affect the 30S subunit. Uh, and the way that I remember the difference is uh, macro, meaning sort of big, uh, so 50S are the bigger subunits. Uh, amino, kind of, I can imagine being quite small, like amino acids, uh, they affect the smaller ones of the 30S subunit. Um, so human ribosomes um, are, say, 40S and 60S. Uh, so the way I remember that is the, the first number uh, is odd. So if the first number is odd, it's affecting uh, bacteria ribosomes, but if the first number is even, so 40 or 60, um, it, it affects uh, their, their human ribosomes, so uh, antibiotics aren't targeted uh, against them. So these are just some of the, the, the common side effects that might come up in exam questions. Obviously, antibiotics have a vast array of side effects and every different antibiotics will have a specific side effect. But some of the way, main ones are to remember with penicillins, um, there's a, a large rate of anaphylaxis, so people are penallergic. Um, so a quick discussion here about the difference between an intolerance um, and an allergy. Um, so an allergy is normally when you have um, a systemic inflammatory response and you can that can be an anaphylactic response and whereas an intolerance um, is there's not a systemic um, inflammatory response it's just um, some other response so diarrhea vomiting nausea headache anything else so it's quite important when you talk to patients and they say they're penallergic you go what happens when you take the antibiotics and if they say i feel sick you go, well, that's a common side effect it's an intolerance but it's not technically an allergy um, uh, cephalosporins um, 
people can be anaphylactic and because they work in a similar way to penicillins, they use that beta-lactam ring to break down cell walls. 10% um, of people who are allergic to penicillins will also be allergic to cephalosporins as well. So you have to be careful if people have penicillin allergies, you have to think about whether you need to use cephalosporin or not. Um, clindamycin um, is a antibiotic um, which uh, is known for causing C. diff infections. So we'll speak a bit more about C. diff later. Um, lots of antibiotics can um, precede C. diff infection, but clindamycin is a major one. Clarithromycin, um, if given it intravenously, can cause uh, bad thrombophlebitis, or inflammation of the blood vessels. Um, so we often give it orally. Um, aminoglycosides, I remember the, the no in aminoglycoside, F meaning nephrotoxic. Um, so you shouldn't be giving them it in people with poor renal function. Ototoxic, so extended use can cause um, uh, deafness or reduction in hearing and not in pregnancy, no in pregnancy, because uh, they again make an effective development uh, of the growing fetus. Um, ciprofloxacin and other fluoroquinolones can cause tendinopathy and, and Achilles tendon rupture. So if you have a patient who, who's complaining of uh, calf pain or ankle pain and tender to, to palpate and they've been on some, some ciprofloxacin, you have to think about whether they've got a tendinopathy. Uh, and doxycycline can cause uh, photosensitivity sunlight. So people take doxycycline and find that they go outside and they get um, sunburn a lot easier. So going back to the question, uh, the patient um, is suffering from fever, jaundice and ripe upper quadrant pain. Uh, and many of you might know that is um, the three sides of Charcot's or Charcot's triad. Uh, and that is pathognomonic for ascending cholangitis uh, or sometimes now just called cholangitis. Um, so this is an infection going from the bowel up and into the biliary tree. Um, it's often um, precipitated by obstruction, um, so that's gallstones getting stuck and the stasis of bile leading bacteria to um, being able to get in and affect that bile. Um, the other main cause um, is post-ERCP, um, so if you pass um, an endoscope down and you do some sort of procedure that can introduce bacteria uh, into the biliary tree uh, and that can cause your, your fever um, right upper quadrant pain and jaundice. Um, there's a what's something called Reynolds Pentad, which adds shock and confusion um, to Charcot's triad, uh, and that's for severe uh, cholangitis. Um, and so one of the main precipitants of, of cholangitis are gallstones, uh, and um, a way of remembering the risk factors for gallstones are all the Fs. Um, so fat, female, forty fair, fertile and familial. Um, so obesity, um, being biologically female, uh, being in your middle age, uh, it's more common in Caucasians. Um, it's more common in fertile females, so high estrogen levels can lead to stone formation. Uh, and if you have a family member um, that has gallstones. OK, so moving on. So question four, a 37 year old male being treated for TB complains of orange coloured tears. Which of the following medications is the likely cause? Is it A, isoniazid, B, pyridoxine, C, pyrazinamide, D, ethambutol, or E, rifampicin? So I would go with uh, rifampicin. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, tuberculosis. So as said earlier, um, the most common pathogen uh, by far is uh, Mycobacterium tuberculosis. It, it has that waxy coating on the outside, um, which means it doesn't gram stain very well. So we call that an acid fast bacilli. So they're rod shaped and acid doesn't stick to them in the gram staining process. So AFBs. Um, so um, we have to use other stains like a Zeal Nielsen stain or a ZN stain. Um, see them um, on the slide. Um, so TB um, predominantly affects the lungs, so 70% of TB will be pulmonary, but 30%, so a significant amount, is extra pulmonary, so outside the lungs. Um, so TB can form almost anywhere in the body, but common extra pulmonary sites are in lymph nodes, in the spine, which is called POTS disease, in the pleura of the lungs, in the central nervous system, um, in the GI tract, uh, the genital urinary tract and cutaneous TB. So uh, lots of different places um, you can find TB. So you can have um, what's called active TB. So that's when you have active symptoms uh, 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 in some area of the body. Um, but uh, the TB can call, uh, become encapsulated in the body because it can form uh, granulomas and seal itself off. And in that case, it's called latent TB. Um, so you'll be 
exposed at some point, you may have um, some symptoms or none. Um, the bacteria seals it itself off uh, and that becomes latent, but it can reactivate later in life if you're immunosuppressed um, or just um, spontaneously, and then you'll get the, the full symptoms of active TB again. And then quickly just mentioning multi-drug resistant TB. Uh, and so that's tuberculosis, here, which is resistant to greater than one antibiotic, so multi-drug, so more than one antibiotic. Um, it's becoming more of a problem um, as, uh, as we treat TB more. So the presentation of TB, um, so it's a slower onset, so it can be over uh, you know, months to years from, from the point of exposure. Um, patients will often talk about fevers and drenching night sweats, as well as weight loss. So all things that might make you think about um, maybe a cancer, maybe like the weight loss, but also important to think about TB, um, cough and sometimes hemoptysis, but not necessarily. Obviously, if it's not pulmonary TB, you won't necessarily have a cough, um, a palpable lymph nodes, uh, and then sometimes skin changes. So this is erythema nodosum, uh, which is more commonly seen on the shins. Um, so there's a few different tests to diagnose TB, which I, I thought I'd cover here quickly because they, they can be um, easy to ask questions on. Um, so going from the top, we had the MAN2 test, uh, which isn't used very often anymore, uh, but they've sometimes asked questions about it. Um, so you get tuberculin, which is uh, an antigen of the tuberculous bacterium, uh, and you inject that just under the skin, so intradermally. And then you wait and then you come back a few days later um, and if there's an induration of at least five millimetres, meaning sort of a redness surrounding where you've injected, um, that shows that your body has been exposed to TB before. Um, you have uh, white blood cells which act against it. They've caused an immune response uh, and they've caused that induration and that inflammation. Um, but all it does is it shows that you've been exposed to the tuberculin, the TB antigen before. So that could be you currently have active TB, it means you could have latent TB, or you could even just be vaccinated against TB. Um, oh, sorry. Um, so a more common test we use now uh, is an interferon gamma release assay or an IGRA. Uh, often you'll hear the brand name be used, something like quantiferon. Um, so this isn't a skin test, this is a blood test. Um, and they take the blood and they mix it with tuberculin, again, the, uh, the, the antigen. Uh, and if the white blood cells release interferon, um, it shows that, uh, again, that you've previously been exposed to TB and have those white blood cells. Um, primed against that bacteria. Uh, and we tend to use that for latent TB. We don't tend to use that to diagnose active TB. If you have active symptoms, so if you've got cough, uh, you know, night sweats, any of the symptoms of TB, the test we tend to use uh, is something called a smear test, um, which is when you get uh, a bit of the patient's sputum and you smear it um, across, um, a, you know, a, a, a microscope, uh, microscope plate and you look down the microscope and you may see these acid fast bacilli on a zeal nielsen stain um, so they're the bacilli looking bacteria um, you can do a culture um, although it's very difficult to culture um, tb it grows very slowly um, you often have to do multiple sputum samples before starting treatment and grow it for many weeks to get a positive sample um, you can do blood cultures if if you have um uh, if it's in the blood um, but you can't do that in normal uh, blood culture bottles you have to use special tb blood culture bottles um, and if you have um, lymph nodal disease, you can do biopsies um, and try and get some of the uh, TB that way. Uh, but often um, with active TB, it's difficult to get um, a, a positive lab result. So often treatment is started if they have a good history of TB and a good clinical suspicion uh, before you have a, a, a positive uh, test. A uh, quick mention about Miller-E TB. So Miller-E TB um, is sort of disseminated severe TB. Um, it gets its name from the X-ray finding. So these tiny little spots are, are, are tiny regions of, of the bacteria uh, and it kind of looks like millet seeds, which are uh, these seeds here uh, where you get the name Miller-E TB. Um, so uh, this is a common um, uh, x-ray interpretation that you might get in an OSCE or in an exam um, and you can see it almost immediately um, so it's quite good to know what Miller-E TB looks like. So going on to the treatment of TB, so you have to use a combination of antibiotics and that can be remembered with the uh, mnemonic RIPE. So that'd be rifampicin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide and ethambutol. 
Uh, and it depends if you'll have latent TB or active TB. Active TB, you might need rifampicin and isoniazid for six months and pyrazinamide and ethambutol for two. And you, or if you're trying to treat latent TB, you could have either a three month course or a six month course. Now, it's not vitally important to remember the exact courses because um, it can differ if you have drug resistance or if you have uh, side effects from one of the drugs, they have to be swapped out. Um, so all treatment of TB is led by a specialist TB treatment centre, normally an infectious diseases team or the respiratory team. Um, but good to remember that the, the right pneumonic, just to, if you ever see these antibiotics around, think about the patient might be on TB because they're very rarely used for any other condition, really. Uh, so going on to the question, um, so about the side effects of the treatment of TB, um, they are, are easy to ask questions about because they're, they're very specific. Not many other um, medications will give you uh, uh, orange uh, excretions. Um, so rifampicin can cause uh, orange red excretions and it's every excretion. So it's in it's in tears, it's in it's in semen, it's in sweat. It can cause anything which you always have to prepare the patient for before they start on it. Um, uh, isoniazid um, causes B6 deficiency, which can cause peripheral neuropathy. Um, so it's often co-prescribed with a B6 supplement, which is pyridoxine. Um, to try and reduce the amount of peripheral neuropathy. Uh, pyrazinamide um, leads you susceptible to gout uh, and ethambutol can cause changes leading to colour blindness and reduce visual acuity. So, but colour blindness actually starts first before moving on to problems of visual acuity. So before you start ethambutol, you have to do uh, one of those Ishihara plate tests to see if you have uh, already got colour blindness, um, because if you do, it's probably best not to use ethambutol um, because you won't be able to tell if it's um, having negative effects on your sight uh, because you won't be able to tell those first signs of colour blindness. Um, so there's a, a, a way of remembering each of the side effects um, of these specific TB antibiotics. Um, so for verfampicin, I remember red and orange persin, uh, as in red and orange secretions. Isoniazid is I'm so numazid, um, so that's peripheral neuropathy um, caused by obviously that B6 deficiency. Uh, pyrazinamide, I remember pain as in a mi, so pain caused by gout. And ethambutol, I remember ithambutol. Um, just a way of uh, remembering that it's a bit silly, but it sticks in my mind. So moving on, um, so question five, uh, a 17 year old male attends A&E with a one week history of fatigue and headache. A urine sample tests positive for mycoplasma pneumoniae. Which of the following antibiotics is effective against mycoplasma pneumoniae? Is it A, chlorothromycin, B, piperacillin and tazobactam, also known Tazacin, is it C, Keftraxone, uh, D, Meropenem, or E, Vancomycin? Um, so I think the most commonly prescribed one to treat um, mycoplasma pneumonia would probably be clarithromycin. So let's go and talk about why. So what this patient seems to be suffering from is an atypical or a walking pneumonia. Um, so a atypical pneumonia is a is a pneumonia caused by a bacteria which isn't um, one of the normal ones. So normal bacteria normally cause pneumonia is something like pneumococcus, so streptococcus pneumoniae or, or, or homophilus influenza. They're the, the main common ones. Um, but the main um, bacteria which cause atypical pneumonia are mycoplasma pneumoniae, um, Legionella pneumophila, which causes uh, Legionnaire's disease, uh, which we'll talk about a bit more, uh, and Chlamydia um, pneumoniae. Um, so atypical uh, pneumonias often present with um, non-typical symptoms. When you think of pneumonia, you might think of a cough, sort of productive sputum, stuff like that. Uh, but atypical pneumonias might be more constitutional symptoms like fatigue, tiredness, general malaise, maybe some headache, things that don't necessarily point um, directly to a pneumonia. So speaking a little bit more about the specific pathogen, so mycoplasma pneumoniae um, is the smallest free living organism that we've ever discovered, which I think is quite interesting. It doesn't have a cell wall, as we said previously, so it won't gram stain. Um, so it, and because it doesn't have a cell wall, it won't be susceptible to antibiotics which target cell wall synthesis. But I think all the other ones are, are 
on that chart uh, on the question um, were targeting cell walls. They won't be useful uh, against mycoplasma. So um, it, mycoplasma uh, pneumonia counts for five to ten percent um, of all pneumonias, uh, and it's the actually the most common pathogen in young people. So if uh, you're, you're under the age of 40, say, uh, and you get uh, a chest infection, it's actually most likely caused uh, by mycoplasma pneumonia. Um, and quinolones or, or, or tetracyclines are, are the, the first line antibiotics because they don't work uh, against cell walls, so they'll have some use. Um, so that leads me on to talking about antibiotic coverage. So the idea of what antibiotic works against what, against what bacteria. Um, so we can talk about broad spectrum antibiotics and narrow spectrum antibiotics. So a broad spectrum antibiotic is an antibiotic which covers lots of different species. So uh, uh, tazacin down here or, or covamoxiclav here uh, cover a wide variety of the antibio uh, the bacteria up here. Uh, and a more narrow spectrum antibiotic, uh, maybe the ones we were talking about for TB, like um, rifampicin, which they work very well on TB, uh, but won't work well on, on, on many other bacteria. So rifampicin here works against Mophilus and Moraxella and TB. Uh, but not really against anything else. Um, so when you don't when you don't know what bug is causing the infection, you're better to go for a broad spectrum antibiotics to give more chance of covering. Whereas when you have isolated the anti uh, the bacteria and you know what it's sensitive to, you're better off going for uh, a specific, maybe more narrow spectrum antibiotic. Um, yeah. Um, so I wanted to talk about the CURB65 score here. Um, so this patient is suffering from a community acquired pneumonia. Um, so when you come in with a community acquired pneumonia or a CAP, you can use the CURB65 score um, for um, working out how severe um, the pneumonia is. Um, so you get one point for each of the following categories, confusion, a high urea, a high resp rate, a low blood pressure or age greater than 65. And depending on your score, it gives you a, a, a 30 day mortality risk uh, and it helps you decide um, whether you want them to admit them to hospital and have intravenous antibiotics or maybe whether they're well enough um, to go home. So if you have a high CURB 65 score. So we know they've got a community acquired pneumonia. We know that it's severe, but we're not quite sure what, which, antibi uh, which bacteria it is yet. You might want to give them cover. So you might want to prescribe antibiotics which cover both typical pathogens and atypical pathogens such as mycoplasma or legionella. So you might want to give them a broad spectrum antibiotic like coamoxiclav to cover um, the majority of the the typical pathogens, but then you might want to use a secondary antibiotic like corithromycin um, against some of the atypical um, and, uh, bacterium because it will work a little bit better against these. And because it's a severe pneumonia, we don't really have much time. We want to hit that bacteria hard and early. Um, so we don't want to spend five days treating them with Kermoxiclav and then only finally realizing after that that it's actually a, a bacteria which works better against a different antibiotic and then by then it's too late. Um, so it helps guide your clinical treatment. But obviously each um, area and each hospital will have their own antibiotic guidance um, regards to resistances in that area. OK, so I think this is question six. I can't remember quite now, maybe five. Uh, a 23 year old student attends A&E with a headache and a fever and a lumbar puncture is performed. You receive the following results. Um, so the appearance is cloudy. They have an elevated opening pressure. Uh, they have white blood cells, primarily polymorphonucleocytes. Um, they have a low glucose in comparison to their serum uh, and they have an elevated protein in the CSF. So which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? So they have viral meningitis, tuberculous meningitis, bacterial meningitis, fungal meningitis, or a subarachnoid hemorrhages. So we'll go back to the uh, results from the LP just to give you a chance. So I think they probably have a bacterial meningitis. So let's go on to talk a bit more about that. Um, so you get different lumbar puncture results depending on the, the different pathogen that's causing the, the meningitis. Um, 
so the appearance when you first get the CSF out, if it's cloudy, um, it might be that's supposed to be clear. I'm sorry, not clear. Uh, it might be that the it's caused by bacteria uh, that are producing uh, uh, proteins that are, are more making it cloudy um, or the bacteria itself. Opening pressure, it's not particularly useful. Um, it can be normal or maybe high in all different types of, of, of back, uh, meningitis. Opening pressure isn't always even measured. Um, it's sometimes measured more when you're looking for a uh, sort of raise into cranial pressure. Um, white blood cells are very useful. Um, if it's predominantly neutrophils, then it might be bacterial. If it's predominantly lymphocytes, it might be viral. Or if they're predominantly mon uh, mononuclear, it might be tuberculous. Uh, the glucose is useful. Um, so the way I remember this is that uh, the bacteria will eat up all the glucose um, that's already floating there in the, in the uh, cerebral spinal fluid. So that will be low, uh, and and they produce protein uh, uh, as a um, as a byproduct. So glucose low, protein high. Um, the virus um, don't use glucose. They don't have uh, you know, normal um, metabolism that we think about in terms of um, microscopic organisms. Um, so the glucose will be normal. Um, they still can produce some uh, proteins. Um, and again, the fungi and TB will, will use up that glucose. So it will be low um, in comparison to, to the serum. So let's talk a bit about um, bacterial meningitis. Um, so there's another triad of, of fever, headache and neck stiffness. Um, uh, and another common symptom that people also throw in is, is photophobia. Um, so that's a classical presentation of, of uh, uh, meningitis. Um, so this here is, is a meningococcal rash. So meningococcus is that um, gram negative cocci, um, Neisseria, um, and that can often cause a non-blanching rash. Um, so if you press down on one of these lesions and take your, your, your finger off, um, the, the rash won't blanch, so it won't go white, so it will stay the same colour no matter whether you're pressing it or not. Um, so meningococcus is, is a common cause of bacterial meningitis, um, but uh, there are other organisms which cause it uh, also, um, depending on uh, age group there you go um so depending on the age group will will we'll, um uh dictate um which pathogens are more common um so listeria more common in in the young and the old um neisseria more common in 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 adults and, and children not so common in in, in newborns um and streptococcus is sort of common throughout so let's talk about the treatment of meningitis so you have a bacterial infection within your CNS. So you need some good, strong antibiotics, some bactericidal antibiotics. Um, so if you're in the community, if, if you've got to the GP and you need to give an antibiotic quickly, you might give uh, penicillin G or benzyl penicillin IV um, or intramuscular if you can't get access in the community. Uh, in the hospital, we normally give broad spectrum um, bacterial sidal antibiotics like keftriaxone or maybe other cephalosporins um, is normally first line. We can consider using steroids to try and reduce some of the inflammation in the CNS. Um, and it's also important to remember that um, meningitis can prevent with sepsis as well. And, and uh, it's a distinctly different um, uh, disease sepsis. You can have sepsis without meningitis, you can have meningitis without sepsis, uh, or you can have both at the same time. Um, so let's quickly just cover sepsis. Um, so sepsis um, is the systemic inflammatory response syndrome, so SIRS, um, secondary to infection, and it should be causing um, organ dysfunction. So um, sepsis is sometimes thrown around quite a lot and sometimes it's used synonymously with infection, um, but that's not the case. For it to be sepsis, you need that systemic inflammatory response. So it's an overreaction of, of the person's own immune system. It causes cytokine storms, uh, white cell infiltration, um, and it, that will cause end organ damage. Uh, and that's all in response to an overwhelming in infection. Uh, so yet yeah, a massive immune response, cytokine storm, and it causes leaky capillaries. So uh, your intravascular um, fluid is is leaks out into the tissues, uh, and so the organs aren't well perfused, don't get enough oxygen, and that can lead um, to 
organ dysfunction. Um, so yeah, it causes cardiovascular collapse, which is our definition of shock. So septic shock um, is something to be careful for. Um, it can also cause DIC, so disseminated intravascular coagulopathy. Um, so um, that cytokine storm can cause um, bl blood clots to form within the vessels um, and that uses up all your platelets uh, through consumption of the platelets. So sometimes you'll have a low platelet count for someone with sepsis. Uh, and those um, blood clots in the blood vessels can cause hemolysis as the blood vessels, uh, the blood, red blood cells bump into the, uh, the clots. It can cause hemolysis uh, and it can also cause homeostasis dysregulation. So you can get acidosis with too much lactate being produced uh, because your cells aren't getting enough uh, oxygen. So an interesting thing to note is that of your vital signs, uh, your respiratory rate is often the first to change. So if you have a patient with a high respiratory rate and you're not sure why, be careful because this might be the start of them becoming septic uh, and the blood pressure will drop and the heart rate will, 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 will go up. Um, but these often follow the respirate. Um, so one subcategory of sepsis to note is neutropenic sepsis. So that's low neutrophils, so a neutral less than one. Um, can lead you very susceptible because neutrophils are the white blood cell which tend to fight bacteria. Um, so people who have a neutral less than one, uh, they often get broad spectrum antibiotics like tazacin, just to make sure that they don't have uh, overwhelming infection. Um, otherwise, they will do very badly because they haven't got the white cells to fight it. Um, so yet here are the markers of sepsis. So you can. Um, use their uh, their vital signs and laboratory values um, to get a score uh, and there's also some lab markers you can do so creatinine might go high as your kidneys um, become um, damaged your platelets might be low as you get that DIC uh, you might have clotting abnormalities uh, because your liver is being hypoperfused so it can't produce clotting factors and your lactate might be up because like I said you have anaerobic respiration um, because the not enough uh, oxygen is going to your cells um, so I think uh, we all might have heard of the sepsis six. So this is the treatment for sepsis. So I remember it is three in and three out. So you want three things out of your patient. So you want blood cultures to see if they have any bacteremia, so any uh, bacteria growing in their blood. Um, you want uh, their lactate to figure out um, how much uh, anaerobic respiration is ongoing. And you want to measure their urine output um, to make sure their kidneys are still working. So they're the three out and then three in, you want to give a fluid challenge. So you want to give them fluids to raise their blood pressure to try and perfuse organs. You want to give IV antibiotics and you want to normally give that within the first hour of identifying sepsis and then you want to give high flow oxygen to make sure they're not hypoxic. So three in and then three out and then obviously re-review regularly. So question seven, uh, a 67 year old female attends A&E uh, with dysuria and increased urinary frequency. Her respirate is 26, her heart rate is 101. A urine culture grew Klebsiella pneumoniae producing an ESBL. What is the appropriate treatment? Would you discharge over three days of nitrofurantoin? Would you discharge over five days of trimethoprim? Would you discharge over seven days of kermoxiclav? Would you admit and start IV meropenem? Or would you admit and start IV kermoxiclav? So I would probably admit this patient and I'd probably start them on meropenem uh, and we'll go on to talk about why. And we need to talk about uh, bacterial resistance. Um, so bacteria become resistant to antibiotic. Um, so it's the bacteria which are resistant. People aren't antibiotics. Often patients will say, oh, I'm resistant to penicillin. Uh, no, that's not quite right. So you just have bacteria which are resistant to penicillin. Um, so there's different types of resistance. There's inherent resistance. So some bacteria um, will be naturally um, resistant to antibiotics, as we were talking about earlier with mycoplasma. It doesn't have a cell wall. Um, so so it will be resistant to beta lactams, which try and break down cell walls. Um, but then you have acquired resistance. Um, so these are mutations and changes that the bacteria make um, to try and become resistant uh, through selection um, to certain antibiotics. Um, so common acquired resistances are beta lactamase. So this is an enzyme, ACE, which breaks down the beta lactam ring. So some bacteria produce this. So it makes penicillins and other beta lactam antibiotics um, less useful. Um, so they can modify um, the target. Um, so some antibiotics focus that 
30 S ribosome subunits um, so they can modify um, the antigens on their ribosome so the antibiotic doesn't recognize it. Um, they can reduce permeability to a drug. Um, so the drug needs to get into the antibiotic to cause its effect and if they have reduced permeability um, you won't get the intracellular concentration needed. Uh, and you can have some bacteria um, which actively export the drug from inside its membrane uh, and they are called efflux pumps. So these are all different classes um, of acquired resistance. So if you have a high level of resistance, um, so uh, a, a resistance mutation which um, leads uh, the bacteria to become highly resistant to a specific antibiotic, you probably need to change the whole class of antibiotics because it would likely be resistance to a different antibiotic of the same class. Whereas if you have low level resistance, so say um, reduced permeability, so this drug can still get in a bit, um, but um, not uh, entirely, you might want to need to increase the dose um, to make sure you get that um, therapeutic intracellular concentration. Um, so let's talk about common pathogens which might become um, resistant. So let's start with, with uh, some Staph aureus. So we know it here because it's in clumps and it's cocci and it's uh, golden. So aureus means gold. Um, so we got some Staph aureus uh, and, and we know that a lot of Staph from earlier, 90% is resistant to penicillin. Um, so it produces penicillin A's, so it breaks down penicillin. Um, so we'll have to use an antibiotic like flucloxacin. Um, so um, some um, staph will become resistant even to flufloxacin and they're called MRSA, so metacillin um, resistant staph aureus. We don't really use metacillin much um, anymore, so I like to think of it as sort of flucloxacillin resistant uh, staph aureus. Um, so in that case, uh, we'll have to use an antibiotic like vancomycin, so a change of class from a penicillin. Um, to a glycopeptide, but now we're seeing some antibiotics which are even, uh, sorry, some bacteria which are even becoming resistant to vancomycin. So we get vancomycin resistant enterococci. Um, so back in the day, the big superbug was MRSA that everyone was scared about, um, but now we even get even worse superbugs um, which are uh, resistant to, to the antibiotic we used to treat MRSA. Um, so let's look at um, another bacteria. So this is E. coli. So this is a gram negative rod. Um, so we could use a penicillin um, on this bacteria, often causes UTIs, um, but that penicillin might um, produce a beta lactamase. Um, so this is an enzyme ase which breaks down the beta lactam ring. Um, so we might need to use coamoxiclav. Um, so this is a um, uh, um, amoxicillin uh, mix of clavironic acid. So clavironic acid um, blocks beta lactamase, that enzyme, um, so it can make it more effective. Um, so however, we can get ESBLs, which stand for extended spectrum beta lactamase. So it produces beta lactamase um, that um, affects an extended amount of bacteria, in which case Kermox clav won't be useful. Um, so we have to use carbapenems like meropenem. But once again, we're getting some superbugs um, that are even resistant to carbapenems. Um, so that'd be a carbapenemase producing um, enterobacteria, so just a bacteria. Um, so these are the real bad superbugs of the future, which we're trying to stop um, the growth of. Um, so the patient, um, going back to the question, um, 67 year old female, she's got dysuria, she's got urinary frequency and she's got some systemic changes and she's grown a gram negative rod um, in her urine culture. So it seems like she might be suffering from a UTI. Um, so let's talk about UTIs. Um, so they can be divided into lower urinary tract infections and upper urinary tract infections. So lower, lower urinary tract infections affects the bladder, uh, affects the urethra. Um, can cause bladder inflammation, so cystitis. You get those common symptoms of increased urinary frequency, urinary urgency, sometimes incontinence. Uh, you can get pain when you're passing urine and occasionally um, hematuria, so blood in the urine caused by the bacteria. Uh, 
So upper UTIs caused in the ureters or in the in the in the kidneys. So kidney infection known as pyelonephritis. Um, they can have more systemic symptoms. So fever, um, sometimes vomiting. You can get renal angle tenderness. So that's tenderness in the flank region. And they're much more likely to cause sepsis because they're more likely to get into the into the blood system. So that's uh, severe inflammatory response syndrome secondary to infection. So risk factors for UCIs being female, just having a shorter, or sorry, biologically female, having a, a shorter urethra means the more, the more likely a bacteria are to, uh, to get into the urinary system. Catheters, so plastic tubes um, in the urinary system where bacteria can go down. Sexual activity, so moving bacteria around, um, getting into the urinary um, system. And urinary stasis, so stopping the flow of urine. So, um, you know, uh, benign prostatic hyperplasia, uh, growth of the prostate over time cause the urine to, to fail to come out and you have retention and that bacteria is a is a breeding ground uh, that sorry that urine is a, is a breeding ground for bacteria. So the most common pathogen in, in UTIs is E. coli. Um, some other common ones are Klebsiella, uh, Staph saprophyticus as we talked about earlier and Enterococcus. Um, so let's talk about a bit about urine dip analysis. Um, so you can look for nitrites, which are breakdown products um, of, of bacteria, and you look, can look for leukocytes, um, which are white blood cells uh, fighting bacteria. So of nitrites and leukocytes, nitrites uh, are, have a higher positive predictive value for, for indicating a UTI. Um, so a, a urine dip test can be useful for identifying, identifying bacteria in the urine. Um, however, it's not particularly useful and urine dips are actually not licensed diagnose UTIs in women over 65 because that's because um, they can have bacteria. So that's bacteria in the urine, uh, but not necessarily causing infection. Um, so if you have a positive dip, you don't know if it's a urinary tract infection or simply bacteria living there. Um, so you shouldn't really be doing urine dips to diagnose UTIs in, in older women. Um, so the treatment of UTIs uh, Uncomplicated lower UTIs in women, it's normally three days of antibiotics, nitrofurantoin um, or, or trimethoprim are common ones. You can have that in the community. Uh, but if it's in men or in pregnant women or if it's catheter associated, you normally have to give a longer course of, of antibiotics. Um, and obviously this patient had grown an ESBL, um, so it wouldn't be um, he had uh, uh, an ESBL, which wouldn't be appropriate um, to a lot of these antibiotics. It would be resistant and she's showing showing signs of 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 organ dysregulation. So she she might be, uh, you know, um, experiencing sepsis here, urosepsis. So we probably need to get her in, get her started on some strong intravenous antibiotics, which will work against that ESBL. Question eight, uh, an 18 year old, uh, 19 year old male attends A&E uh, with a five day history of fever and sore throat. Uh, which of the following is not part of the Centaur criteria? So is it A, exudate, uh, B, absence of cough, C, fever, D, palpable lymph nodes, or E, a sore throat? Um, so uh, it's E, a sore throat is not part of the Centaur criteria. Uh, so the Centaur criteria um, is used in, in helping the diagnosis of bacterial tonsillitis. Um, so the C stands for absence of cough. Always remember it's the absence, not the presence of cough. E for exudate, so that's uh, horrible mucky pus coming out of the tonsils. A is for lymph nodes. Um, T is for fever temperature. Uh, and the OR used to stand for uh, young or old or an age modifier. Uh, but in the UK, we don't actually use that anymore. So it's just one to four of the Centaur criteria. Um, so if you have score one or two, um, you have a 15 to 30 percent chance of, of having group A strep in your throat. So remember strep, they're, they're gram positive, so they're growing, um, they're wearing their big fluffy blue down jackets. They like um, dry um, environments uh, like the throat and they don't mind it if it's too cool because they've got that nice thick peptidoglycan uh, cell wall. Um, so Strep A is actually the most, group A strep, sorry, um, is the um, most common cause of, of, of bacterial tonsillitis. Um, so if you have a low Centaur score, you don't necessarily need to treat. If you have a high Centaur score, the chance of it being group A strep is much higher um, and that probably needs treatment. Um, so let's talk about tonsillitis. So tonsillitis is actually much more commonly caused by viruses. Um, so 50 to 80 percent 
Um, so a large amount of, of, of tonsillitis don't need antibiotics, but if you have that high CENTOS score, it's much more likely to be caused by a group A strep. Um, so it's much more likely to need antibiotics. Uh, common bacterial pathogens, again, viruses are more common, but if it is bacterial, uh, the common ones are group A strep uh, and strep pneumonia. And we know when we talked previously that most streps are sensitive to penicillin, so we can use penicillins quite well. Um, so you can use phenoxymethyl penicillin or pen V. Um, I would, used to call this pen five, like the, the Roman number for five for ages, but I since learned it's pen V. Um, and you tend to tend to give that over a, a 10 day course. Uh, and obviously there is tonsillectomy, uh, which is normally curative uh, removal of that uh, tonsillar tissue. So question nine, uh, the infection control nurse asks you to identify any patients on the ward with a notifiable disease. Which of the following is not a notifiable disease? Uh, is it A, typhoid fever, uh, B, C. diff, C, tetanus, D, Legionnaire's disease or E, Lyme's disease? So I would go with uh, at C, uh, sorry, B, C diff. All the rest are notifiable diseases. So notifiable diseases are, are diseases that when confirmed, they need to be reported to government authorities um, to, to track um, people who are exposed, uh, contacts, uh, and uh, often to, to look for different strains of, of the bacteria and to monitor um, its treatment. Um, so all of the uh, other ones are notifiable, um, so you have to tell the government. Um, there's this useful resource on the government website, uh, which ones tell you which are urgent to refer and, and which you need to refer just uh, more routinely. Um, so of those um, diseases mentioned, I thought I'd just quickly go through them because they often come up um, uh, in, in real life and, and, and in exams. Um, so I'd quickly just do a, a one page fact sheet on all of them. Um, so typhoid fever or enteric fever, as it's sometimes called, um, is caused by Salmonella typhi. So that's the way of amending typhoid fever. So it's an infection with the bacteria Salmonella. So we know Salmonella is a gram negative rod because it's not staph or strep. It's not Neisseria, it's not ABCDL, so it must be a gram negative rod. Um, it's spread through fecal oral transmission, through contaminated food and water, um, so it's more likely um, in, in developing countries which don't have um, as good sanitations. Um, interestingly, humans are the only known natural reservoir, um, so you don't tend to see it in, uh, in other um, animals. Um, the symptoms generally due to be diarrhea, abdominal pain, fever, and organome organomegaly, so splenomegaly and, and hepatomegaly. Um, you can become a carrier, and they, it's when the bacteria sit around in the gallbladder, and slowly the bacteria gets passed into the stool uh, and, and can be passed um, fecally orally to, to other people. Um, so this is a picture of typhoid Mary. Um, so she was one of the first carriers uh, of typhoid fever of Salmonella, uh, and it was predicted that she she gave over a hundred people um, enteric fever, and for she was isolated uh, for. I think the last 10 years of her life or something, she was isolated away because of uh, trying to stop um, uh, the passing on of enteric fever. Um, so it, it's treated normally in hospital with, with broad spectrum antibiotics to, that would be susceptible to uh, that salmonella infection. Um, so C. difficile or C. diff infection, um, we know is a gram positive rod. Um, so C. diff is a opportunistic pathogen. Um, so it causes problems when it gets into the gut uh, and normal gut flora is eliminated through um, other courses of antibiotics. So you often get it in hospital patients who have had prolonged courses of maybe different antibiotics that kills off the competition and the C. diff can come to the forefront and replicate because um, it has less competition. Um, it produces two different toxins, A and B. These toxins cause diarrhea, uh, can lead to dehydration, uh, can cause inflammation and lead to toxic megacolon. And the inflammation can get so bad that the bowel can actually perforate. So um, anyone who has sort of uh, uh, symptoms of, of type 7 stool, so that's diarrhea um, with a recent you know, hospital admission or currently in hospital with having received uh, antibiotics, probably needs um, a stool sample to diagnose the C. diff. Um, it's treated with oral vancomycin, so you can't give intravenous because the bacteria are living in the gut, so you need the antibiotics to get into the gut, so you give it orally. Uh, 
Um, so C. diff can be a part of, of your normal gut flora uh, and it doesn't cause any problems. Um, so it's only treated if you have symptoms or, or the toxins detected. Um, so you don't necessarily have to treat it if it's just there and not causing any problems. Um, so one thing to note is that PPIs exacerbate the disease. So you, you reduce the amount of acid in the stomach. The acid normally probably breaks down the bacteria. Um, so if you have C. diff, um, you need to probably stop the patient's PPI to try and help them recover. Uh, so tetanus uh, caused by the Clostridium genus as well, but this is Clostridium tetani. Um, so it's an obligate anaerobe, so it must live without oxygen. Um, so it's found in soil. Um, it gets into the body um, through penetrating wounds. So that's the classic dirty, dirty nail getting for stepping on 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 a, on a rusty screw or something like that. Um, so uh, the bacteria produces a toxin called uh, tetanospasmin uh, and that can affect uh, the neuromuscular and causes rigidity and spasms uh, and you get facial spasms. Um, it only affects skeletal muscle so you won't get changes in, in your cardiac muscle or your smooth muscle um, and it's characterized by another triad of strismus, uh, so locked jaw, uh, ridis sardonicus, abnormal uh, grin, so that's this one here, so contraction of the facial muscles and op Thalmotonus. Uh, you can tell how often I pronounce this. Um, it's not a very common sign, uh, but that's the, the spasm of all the body. I couldn't even find a picture of it in an actual patient. I had to find a, a painting. Um, so not very common um, because most people get vaccinated against it, um, but it can be seen in, in places where uh, the vaccine is, is less common. Uh, Legionnaire's disease, um, so caused by Legionella pneumophila, normally causes uh, atypical pneumonias, as we spoke about previously. Um, it was named um, because it was in a conference of the um, American Legion, um, where a, a large portion of them caught um, Legionella pneumophila, and then since it was named after it. Um, so the bacteria has to be aerosolized. Um, and breathed in uh, for it to cause infection. So in your infectious disease history or in your clinical vignettes, if it says about um, air con or in showers or in water spray systems, so anywhere you're aerosolizing water and breathing it in, um, Legionnaire's disease might be a problem. Um, to test for it, um, you can look in the urine for some of the antigens which get passed and that can give you a positive um, diagnostic test for Legionella. Um, and it's treated uh, much like a lot of the other atypical um, pneumonias uh, with macrolids or, or quinolones. Uh, the final one was Lyme's disease. Um, so Lyme's disease was is, uh, caused by a, a spirochete. So that's a, a type of, of bacteria. So that's uh, they kind of look like these spiral worm looking ones, but they're not worms. They are actually bacteria uh, and they're caused by the Borrelia genus. So the way that I remember that is the they bore into the skin and kind of look like a worm and they and they move by twisting. And so they bore into the skin like boring for oil. Um, they're called by Borrelia. Um, so the natural reservoirs in rats and lizards and birds. Lots of people think about ticks because they often come from tick bites, um, but that's actually a vector. The actual reservoir is in, is in other animals, so the tick will bite another animal and then it will bite a human and it gets passed over in the saliva into the bloodstream. Um, so they can cause erythema migrans. So this is this here. This is a, a bullseye type rash, which is pathognomonic for Lyme's disease. So you get that localized uh, erythema uh, and then it spreads to look like a target. Um, so it can get quite bad complications from Lyme disease. Um, so, so, so this is where the, the tick would bite in the, in the center as the vector uh, and then you get the swelling surrounding it. Um, so the complications, it can spread to uh, the myocardium of the heart or my, myocarditis. It can cause central nervous system infections, meningitis uh, and problems with arthritis and, and facial nerve palsy. Right, uh, final question. I hope I haven't taken too long. Um, you are looking after a 40 year old female uh, with SLE on hydroxychloroquine and prednisolone. Which of the following bacterial vaccines is contraindicated? So I would say the BCG vaccine, Mycobacterium bovis. So SLE, she's got lupus uh, and she's on some immunosuppressants. Um, so we need to be careful about what vaccines we give her. So let's talk a little bit about bacterial vaccines. 
So there's sort of two different vaccines. So you can get passive vaccines, which is when you just administer preformed antibodies or immunoglobulins by an infusion, uh, and that can be given um, if you are having um, symptoms of tetanus, diphtheria, or, or botulism from um, Clostridium botulinum, um, uh, and that could, they will work once. You know the antibodies were used up, but your body won't produce any of their own. Uh, or you can give active vaccines, um, which is ones we think about more when we think about vaccines, um, where you inject either the bacteria or a product of the bacteria or, or a neutralized version of the bacteria, and, you, and your body will form um, B memory lymphocytes that produce plasma cells, um, which fight it if you ever come against the bacteria uh, again. Um, so there's several different ways you can cause an immune response. So you can inject a, a polysaccharide, um, so that's the pneumococcus vaccine, meningococcal vaccine, a homophobus vaccine. Um, you can uh, uh, inject a toxoid, so that's like a toxin, but in active, in, in active form. Um, so that's the diphtheria vaccine, the tetanus vaccine, uh, uh, and a, a whooping cough vaccine. Um, you can give them killed bacteria, so typhus, Q fever, uh, a Yersinia. Uh, so that was the bacteria that caused the, caused the Black Death, Yersinia pestis. We now have a, a vaccine against it. Um, or you can give live attenuated uh, uh, vaccines. Um, so this is where the bacteria is not killed, it's alive. It, it, it's just sort of neutralized, so it shouldn't be causing um, any, any systemic infection. The body should be able to fight it off. Uh, but if you have a lowered immune system, um, like the, the patient did with, on the immunosuppressants, they might not be able to adequately fight off the bacteria, even if it is attenuated. Uh, and so an example of that is the Mycobacterium bovis vaccine or, or the BCG vaccine. So we've, we've covered a lot today. I'm sorry if I've rushed and I'm sorry if I've not gone into a, a huge amount of detail everywhere, but um, so the things we've covered, um, different uh, pre presentations of different uh, diseases, antibiotics, their resistances uh, uh, and um, uh, different classifications. Um, so things that I couldn't quite fit into all these questions and uh, things that you might want to do a bit more reading on um, is possibly cholera or more tropical infectious diseases, um, STIs I have or pelvic inflammatory disease are diseases of the genitourinary tract I haven't covered in a huge amount of details, uh, abscesses, cellulitis, gangrene, uh, infections of bone, infections in the middle ear, infections of the peritoneum, uh, and necrotizing fasciitis, um, all a good idea to read up on. Um, so as I've been going through the slides, I've been trying to put references as we went along, but these are the main resources that I've used. This textbook was very good. I managed to get free access online, so you might be able to get to either. It's very well uh, led out, or if, you, if you're more a visual learner and you uh, uh, learn from uh, videos and such, these are uh, three really good uh, resources. Brilliant. That, that was it, guys. I hope you find it useful um, some way or another. Um, it'd be really useful to us if you could fill out some feedback um, so we can improve the talks uh, and you can tell us um, what you found useful and what you didn't. Uh, and if you fill out the feedback, um, you actually get a link to the slides um, so you can go on all the links and, and revisit the topics.